everyone. My name is Gina Hugo. I'm the Parks Coordinator in Sherburne County and on the board of Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails, representing District 4. Um, thanks for joining us for today's forum. Uh, pretty excited about this one. It's featuring a presentation from one of our newest business members, Jeremy Ninau of Ninau Cultural Consulting. Um, with Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trail Commission's new funding opportunity, there really couldn't be a better time to cover the basics of what archaeological surveys are and where they fit into park development and opportunities for interpretive features. And I've been fortunate enough to work with Jeremy on a couple of projects, and I've learned a lot from him. Um, I found him to be an excellent teacher, and so we really appreciate him being with us today. So, Joe, I'll pass it over to you um, to give us the, the scoop on the new funding. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Glad to be here talking with everyone. And uh, Renee Matson, our executive director, is here to answer questions as well, if, if anyone has any. Um, for a couple of years at least, uh, the commission has been paying attention to and listening very closely to a lot of our partner agencies across greater Minnesota that have been, let's say, struggling a little bit with the state's requirements for environmental review, archaeological studies, um, and our increasing uh, requirements for outreach to tribal historic preservation offices. Um, expenses have been increasing. Um, the, the scope of projects are just taking longer, especially during COVID, everybody was understaffed and we understood how that was taking place. Uh, but this was an area that it's, this type of review is typically pre-project, meaning if you are funded for a building project from the commission, these are items that need to be done before that grant contract can be executed. And we just thought this is a barrier that didn't need to quite be so onerous, um, especially for a lot of our smaller agencies that are just not used to the scope or workload that goes on with this sort of, of activity uh, that Jeremy is going to be talking about. So uh, the commission has authorized a new grant opportunity this year through our, our same funding source, just a new opportunity where you can apply for a standalone project for environmental review. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things depending on what your need, needs are. It could be basic, um, it could be basic archaeological survey, EW or phase one or two, uh, SHPO work, working with tribal historic preservation offices, all those sorts of things that typically have happened prior to a construction project can now be funded uh, by legacy up to $50,000 of legacy funds. Uh, with a required 20% minimum local match, whatever the project size is. If it's smaller than that, 20%. If it's larger, uh, probably more than 20% if it's going to be bigger. Um, so it is an opportunity. It's not going to cover everyone's costs, but we think it'll it'll get a lot of folks going and be a big help, especially to our smaller agencies uh, that are trying to figure out this type of activity. It is so important as Gina can attest to, and so many of you can attest to, to really do a good job in understanding what your property is about, what the opportunities are. And we think it's a fantastic way to create a whole new experience that is going to be inclusive of your entire community and provide a, a great outdoor recreation experience for all your users that reflects the true local nature of, of your, your region. Um, so this is an opportunity that we hope several agencies will take advantage of this first year. As we, as I said, it is standalone. It's intended to have this take place before a real construction project can take place. Um, we really are recommending that you even apply to do environmental work across one or more phases of your potential facility uh, so that you can cover those areas. Even if you're just looking at one phase, say a campground or a certain segment of trail, take a look at some alternatives within that as well, because we've heard so many times some findings are made and you have to adjust plans, put things into different locations, uh, cover those areas as well that you would be putting things if things had to change. Uh, so we can make sure that all of that area is covered through this sort of project. 
um, so you don't have to keep having that iterative process of trying to find new space. Um, and Jeremy can fill us in a lot more than I'm certainly aware of and how to deal with some of those things. But be 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 expansive, uh, take in as much as you can. Let's take a good look at our at our lands and uh, find out what their history are and how we can use that to best provide an outstanding outdoor recreation uh, focus for our users across greater Minnesota. So $50,000 folks can go a long way for some of these projects and give you a good kickstart. So I hope that's helpful. Is there anything else anyone was looking to learn about this? Funding applications, I should say, are due the same time as all of our other funding applications, uh, July 31st. And it is the same funding application that you find for all of our other types of funding projects as well, all through the online portal, and it's only eligible for our regionally designated facilities. So we can go ahead and segue into Jeremy's presentation now. So I'll invite you to go ahead and share your screen, Jeremy. And all right. Everybody showing up, showing up great. Fantastic. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as Gina said, my name is Jeremy Nino. Uh, I run a small archaeology firm here based out of the Twin Cities called Nino Cultural Consultants. And uh, I think the why of, of why to do this was really succinctly answered and, and talked about just previously. Um, this work is usually work that gets done ahead of your construction or development projects. Uh, you really want to understand and know what's in the ground before you dig. It's just like utility work or other things understanding who was present on the landscape before you, why they were there, what they were doing, are all things of interest to, to everyone really in Minnesota. And one of the easiest, you know, one of the, the easiest questions that I get from people, and they, they always think it's really complex, they say, how do you know that someone wanted to be here? Or how do you know that someone was living on this landscape? And I always just ask them, um, would you like to live in this landscape? Would, would you like to walk here? Would you like to be to camp here? or be present and see this landscape? And they say, of course. And I say, well, it hasn't changed. People have been living in Minnesota for thousands of years uh, prior to us, and uh, we all love the landscape in the same way. And that's something that we share through time. And um, we're, we like to leave little bits of ourselves all over the place. Uh, even to the best of our ability, we still find uh, things and materials and objects from the past and, and just from yesterday, you know, that are out there. So uh, we leave things behind and it is understanding those things and what they can tell us about people in the past that we as archaeologists do. So today I'm going to talk about the basics of what archaeology is. I'm going to talk a little bit through um, how we do that archaeology, and, and then we can ask, a, do some detailed questions for projects that people have. I'm going to try to give you a few of my um, sort of key points that I've come up with over the last couple of years of doing this work. But, you know, so, so I'm, I'm an archaeologist. I have a PhD in historical archaeology from the University of Minnesota, a master's in historical archaeology from the College of William & Mary, and an undergraduate way back in the, in the early 90s from the from UW La Crosse down in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, I've been doing archaeology my entire life um, since 1993, so 30 years this year of doing archaeology. And I've been a professional archaeologist, which is someone who has a master's degree or above, someone who can lead archaeological projects under the Secretary of Interior standards since 2001. So it's 22 years of being a principal investigator. My company uh, has been around for about the last 10 years. Prior to that, I was an educator for about 10 years. And before that, I just worked for lots of other companies doing archaeology. Most of my experience is in the Midwest. Uh, I've lived here almost my entire life with a, a small stint on the East Coast when I was going to William and Mary. Um, most of my work is right in the metro area. I do a lot of urban archaeology or historical archaeology. But however, the development area for Minnesota really expands out from the from the core of the Twin Cities out into the exurbs and then of course out into greater Minnesota and, and there's lots of development happening all the time in our state. Um, we, we love Minnesota. It has so many different biomes and environments and uh, it has lots of great different opportunities to do work. So today we're going to be talking about that. So this this process uh, for it really gets started with this understanding of what archaeology is. 
So this gets to me to my first misconception. And it happens all the time. And in, even my own mother, after many years, will still send me the occasional newspaper article about a dinosaur bone that they found in South Dakota or someplace like that. Uh, archaeology is the study of people in the past. Uh, we don't study dinosaurs. Uh, that is paleontology. It's the most, I get this all the time. Have you ever found any good dinosaur bones? No, I haven't, unfortunately. Uh, we, Minnesota doesn't have a lot of fossil record for the dinosaur period. So I don't really find dinosaur bones, but I find lots of evidence from the last 12,000 years of people living on this landscape. So archaeology is the study of people in the past, and we study it in a very specific way by studying the things that we left behind, the objects, and we call those artifacts. Oftentimes, yes, people think of them as trash, people's trash, but really though, that trash is a treasure because it tells us what people were eating, um, how they were living, the objects that they held and carried around. Anything that you move from one place to another becomes an artifact. Even if you're just taking rocks and moving them around to use them to build foundations for houses or for teepee rings or things like that, they're all artifacts at that point. So that's, that's what archaeologists do. Uh, you have to have a lot of understanding of how people lived in the past, the kinds of things that we left behind, how those things deteriorate over time and how things still uh, remain over time. And then after that, it's it's really getting into a specialty. What kind of archeology span do you like? Do you like Native American or Euro-American? Do you have a breakdown specially within that? I studied the fur trade for, for many, many years when I was an undergraduate. And then eventually I did frontier uh, American archeology span my, for my PhD work. And now I, I'm lucky enough to do all types of archeology span and I hire lots of people who have specialties, whether it's faunal or industrial or pre, you know, lithic analysis. Um, I have all kinds of people to do those different things now for my company. All right, so why uh, and when do you typically encounter archaeology? Uh, and, and Joe talked about this right away. Usually archaeology is done as a part of an environmental review, whether it's an, an environmental assessment worksheet or an environmental impact statement. Maybe you're doing a larger AUAR, which is an alternative urban area-wide review. Our work is usually one question that's part of an environmental, larger environmental review package. So if you're doing an EAW, you have question, used to be question 14, now it's question 15, and it asks, are there any known cultural resources on your property? Um, that's when you bring in an archaeologist to answer that. The reason why we are so closely tied to environmental review projects is because that the National Historic, National Historic Preservation Act was passed around the same time as the Clean Water Act and other environmental acts that we have federally in our, in our country in the 1960s. So it's a, at the same time that we as a country were starting to think about clean air and clean water, we started also thinking about preservation of the past. We set up... Um, all the, the National Historic uh, uh, Places designation for things. We set up the State Historic Preservation Offices at that time, the State Archaeology Programs. They all got started in the late 1960s, and archaeology has always been part of that natural landscape. Also, if your project is going to be using federal money in some way, um, most often for me, uh, when I'm working with a developer and they're using some money from HUD, Housing and Urban Development, because they're doing a, a low-income housing component for their development, um, that money comes with uh, uh, a regulatory requirement that if you're using federal funding for your project, it must go through a review through the National Historic Preservation Act and usually Section 106 of that act. And so then you have to work with the State Historic Preservation Office. Other times, your project may have a state or quasi-state agency that's directly already involved. Maybe it's a DOT project that's going nearby where you're at, or a DNR project. Uh, maybe it's something from the Minnesota Historical Society. Maybe you have an historic uh, property that's already associated with part of your park. Um, so all those agencies also have to go through review. So usually what happens is you think about putting in a park project, whether it's a trail or a new campground or something, and you send that out for environmental review to your various agencies. And um, one of those agencies is usually the State Historic Preservation Office, and maybe it's the Office of the State Archaeologist, the OSA. And SHPO will come back after a period of time with a letter 
to you. So many of you have probably seen this, this letter that I have here on the right. Um, I've, bl I've blacked out the, the project, so you don't know what the project is. But what this letter says is, is the state, the SHPO is telling you, we think there's a potential for there to be archaeology related to your project, and you should go have an archaeologist look at it. Sometimes, and I really should say often, a developer or others will call me on the phone and they'll say, we are all ready to do our project. We've lined up our funding. We've got contracts in place for our ground disturbing people, our construction companies to start their work. And I just got this letter from Shippo. What do I do now? We were completely not expecting this. We, we went through all the other phases. We don't know what archaeology is or why we have to do it. Um, this happens to me a lot. And people oftentimes ignore these letters until the very last moment as well. So that'll be one of my key points today. Do not ignore your regulatory relationship with SHPO and the OSA and others. When they send you a letter, for example, this letter was sent on December 5th, right? I just did the survey for this project last week. So they waited until April to contact me and say, hey, we got this letter. Well, you got the letter in December. Start calling people in December when you get the letter to figure it out. Don't, don't wait and think you can just figure it out later on. Okay, so there are three phases of archaeology work here in Minnesota. Uh, and these phases were established by the Office of the State Archaeologist. They are phase one, identification, phase two, evaluation, and phase three, mitigation. When you are working with the State Historic Preservation Office, Phases one and two are usually combined together. Um, even though your archaeologist will want you to split them apart, um, usually because uh, bidding purposes for us, but more importantly, because if, if we are doing archaeology on public non-federal land in the state of Minnesota, we have to get a license from the state archaeologist's office, and the state archaeology office divides archaeology into three phases, phase one, two, and three. So even though SHPO wants you to identify and evaluate in one phase, I can't because I can't pull a license that's for both phase one and phase two at the same time. So we have to divide things into three phases. And I have some pictures here to tell you, uh, to really to remind me to talk about a few other things. First, archeology span is not done in a vacuum. Um, archeology span is always done in coordination and consultation with other people. Today, uh, and really the last uh, five years, we've started doing more and more consultation with tribes ahead of our work. Um, the top picture is Gina and myself. I took the picture, so I guess I'm not in it. But Gina and, and, and I are meeting with several of the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers here in Minnesota, and we're walking over a project and talking about the things that we found that I found as an archaeologist, and then they are talking about what these things mean, and then together we developed a larger, better understanding of that project, and it has now become a traditional cultural place, uh, and it's a very different way of thinking. So that's really been the last five years. So we we always consult with other people when we're doing our archaeology. The second thing, what the second one says, is that archaeology is also usually a part of construction. Um, we're usually a development phase. We're sometimes working hand in hand with construction and development. So we really need to be at the table when your electrical people are coming through, your utility work is happening, your road graders are occurring, all those different phases. Anytime you are disturbing the soil, you have the potential to run into archaeology. So it's really important early on to understand where the archaeology could be look for the archaeology. If you do have archaeology in an area, think about whether or not that archaeology is important enough to keep going through this process, or can you do your development and move it forward without having to shift maybe where campsites are at or shifting off your trail. We're always trying to preserve archaeology in place if we can. Archaeologists, even though it's my job to dig holes in the ground, the fewer holes I can dig, the fewer times we can impact that site, the better. We want to preserve things as much as we can. Finally, the third picture down there is a picture of my library here at my office. Um, we always start in the library. Before we do any work, uh, we start with what archaeologists have already done in your area, what archaeological sites may be nearby, who wrote a report about things. That's where we start every time, um, especially if we're working in an urban environment. Uh, we look at all kinds of, of, 
earlier plat maps, Sanborn insurance maps, aerial photography. We're always trying to learn before we dig. Uh, it's a pretty important first step in our work. Okay, so let's talk about the first phase. So and again, and, and it's confusing too, uh, because there's environmental phasing as well. So this is just for archeology. span Again, we have three phases, one, two, and three. Phase one is trying to answer the question, is there an archeological site present? Yes or no? Pretty straightforward. We usually divide phase one into two phases. Phase 1A, which is called a literature review, so or a desktop survey. Even before you go out and, and look to see if there's any archaeology in the ground, you might start at the state archaeologist's office or at the historic uh, preservation office or in your library. Do some research ahead of time. Are we likely to have something here? Was this all disturbed by previous utility? Did the river completely change its course and now the place where Native Americans was at is actually a quarter mile the other direction because that's where the river used to be. And then it just got diverted in the last 50 years. And now this is where the channel is today. All those things can help us before we go out. So the, the two easiest things that we do in archaeology for phase one is either we do pedestrian survey, which is just walking across the landscape. And we can do pedestrian surveys anytime we have more than 30% visibility of the ground. So plowed environments, even if you have a fallow field that has a lot of gopher hole, uh, gopher activity in it, you might have enough uh, disturbance to be able to look for arrowheads and things like that. So pedestrian survey is just walking through fields. Most archaeology gets done in the spring and in the fall for phase ones, because farmers are either planting or harvesting and they have lots of visibility in our fields. If we don't have good, good visibility, then we have to do shovel tests. A shovel test is a hole that's about the size of a pizza box. We dig down three feet. We put the dirt into a screen, which is what the, this person is doing here. We screen that soil and we look for artifacts. If we can't see the ground uh, by visibility, we have to put in one of these holes every 50 feet or 15 meters in the most likely places for archaeology. So that's how we do it usually in rural settings when you have farm fields or maybe we're on a, a riverbank or a stream edge. Um, a lot of greater Minnesota is doing these two types of phases. Other times for phase one, we might be having to get out some mechanical stuff and go a lot deeper. This is for a project right along the Mississippi River. We have nine feet of dredge soil that's been put on top of that project. I don't really care about that dredge soil at all, so I have to get down through that. I can't look at it with my normal shovel and my hand screen, so we bring in a big uh, excavator to try to figure that out. Other times, we might, other, we might already know that uh, there is something interesting there because we have historic mapping. And uh, this is an example of a park and called Robinson Park and it's in sandstone. So there's an historic quarry that's there. And so we didn't have to go out and dig any holes. We knew the quarry already existed. We just needed to document that the site was present. So phase one, you're asking the question, is there anything there, yes or no? The archaeologist is trained to understand what are the most likely environments to find sites, both historically and prehistorically, and then what are the best methods to go and look at them. Our methods are oftentimes invasive. You see that most of this involves digging holes or walking across the landscape. We can do archaeology without doing that in a non-invasive way through something called uh, geophysical work, remote sensing, ground penetrating radar, uh, thermal imagery. There's a few other steps as well. Those uh, don't work as well as digging holes in the ground to see if there's something present, but they can work in certain environments. Um, and I could give a whole nother lecture about that if you want, but I, we don't have that kind of time today. But the first phase is, did you? is there something there? Yes or no? All right. Once we've dug the holes, that's only one part of the process. And this is something too that oftentimes you know, I'll put a bid out for a project. Okay, well, you're putting in a trail along a river edge. We're going to go and shovel test every uh, 50 feet along that trail. And then I need to do a lot of work on the backside. If I find an archaeological site, I have to report it to the state. I need to document what was there. I have to photograph it. I have to clean up all the artifacts that we found, make maps, write a report. Um, those things all take time and money. Uh, and oftentimes it's a part that people don't see. And so they tend to think, you know, I'm paying you all this money to do this archaeology. You were out there for two days. Where did the rest of the money go? It's on the backside, um, doing the, the work back in the lab. 
And we always encourage people to come to the lab and experience what we're doing. Uh, this is actually a public archaeology night for a different project where people are coming and washing the artifacts and finding and learning about them and, and right on the spot. Um, also, it's important to notice that, that the artifacts that we do find, I have been trained my entire life to look for things that, you know, basically uh, comparative materials from prehistoric sites that uh, most people will look at and say, that is a rock. And I will say, yes, it was a rock, and now it's been made into a tool by previous people. And it's hard to tell the difference between a rock and a tool. And people come to me all the time. I found this rock. It fits perfectly in my hand. I think it's a Native American artifact. And I'll say, it is just a rock. And lots of rocks fit in your hand. Here's a rock that has been made into something else. And they'll say, I really can't tell the difference. And so we'd sit down, we'd do a little flint mapping and understand it. And then after a while, they figure it out. So it's complicated. Um, but it's been doing what I've been doing my entire life. I'm passionate about it. And I've spent a lot of time learning the difference between natural, naturally occurring things and culturally uh, made things. All right. So phase one, did you, is there a site there? Yes or no? If you answer no to that, I write a little report. Usually it's a letter report that says we went out, we did this project. We This is how we went about doing our work. We did not find any archaeology. We don't recommend any new archaeology for your project. You put that letter in with your environmental review paperwork, you're done. That's the end. There is still, does that mean there's no archaeology on your project? No. It means that we didn't find any archaeology and we use the methods that we are required to by the state. Um, there's still a potential. I only put in a hole every 50 feet. I could have missed the site. It's possible. So, you know, uh, even though I write that letter that says we don't recommend any new archaeology at this time, it's still a good idea to have a plan during your project for unanticipated discoveries. Uh, and that's usually a short protocol document that just says, if you find something, call an archaeologist. If you find human remains, call the sheriff, call the state archaeologist, stop your work for a little period of time. I could give a whole nother talk sometime about doing uh, mitigation and, and un unanticipated discovery projects. But if the answer was yes, did we find a site? Yes, we did. Then the next step is, okay, is that site cool? Does it matter? Is it interesting to people? Um, to me, they're all interesting. Um, however, to most people, they're not that interesting. The, the level of coolness, the factor for that is actually established by the National Historic Preservation Act that says that in order to be cool, it has to have a few things. And we'll talk about what those few things are in a minute. To go about doing archaeology at the phase two evaluation, usually we stop digging small holes and we dig larger holes. Usually they're squares or rectangles. You can see that our work is very precise. Everything is done by hand. We dig down in levels that are four inches or two inches at a time, skim that off, screen it, look for artifacts, and go down another four inches or two inches, and keep going until we have no more archaeology. Um, so this phase two is called evaluation. We're trying to determine if whether or not your site meets the criteria of being important enough to go on the National Register. And here are those kinds of questions that the National Register wants you to think about. Does your site have integrity? Which means is, is there enough of your site left that it hasn't been scattered or disturbed by lots of stuff? So let's say we found, we were walking through a plowed field and we found on the surface of that plowed field, a whole bunch of Native American artifacts from a campsite that was there. We would go back, we would excavate down below the plow zone and see if any of the site exists below the plow zone. If it does, then it still has integrity. If the site is only found in the plow zone, it lacks integrity at that point, and it would not be eligible to the National Register. Um, the next question is, are, is the site discrete and definable and knowable? What that means is, is it in a compact area that you can draw a boundary around so that you can avoid it or go around it or understand it in a, in a better way? If we can't define it, if it's just an entire landscape, it's hard for archaeologists to understand that. And so we usually go into other things like traditional cultural places or landscape studies and not archaeological sites at that point. And then there are four criteria uh, for National Register. This is the basic understanding of this. Criteria A is, is your site associated with major events, the settling of the West, the coming of railroads, the foundation of cities, the advent of agriculture in this area? Those are all major events. So is your site associated with that? That's criterion A. Criterion B is, is your site cool? 
you know, did George Washington come and farm there? I mean, not here in Minnesota, but, you know, you have to get the idea. Was James J. Hill there? You know, was some other, um, and, and was Henry Sibley out there? Um, so there's, that's criterion B. Criterion C is, is this site the perfect example of this kind of site? So is this the perfect example of a mill? or the certain kind of architecture that an architect designed. And this is like Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is the perfect example of a Frank Lloyd Wright house. That would be something that would go under criterion C. But most archeology span falls under criterion D, which is its potential to tell us about people in the past more than we already know from the written record. We usually have good written records that tell us census records, maps and things that show us where people lived who they were and when they lived, but we don't really have documents that say what they ate on a regular basis, what they thought about their landscape, um, what kind of social economic uh, background did they have, what kind of things did they like to buy, what are their preferences, uh, did they like a certain kind of food, did they like a certain kind of ch china or pattern, um, you can't really see that from the documentary record, but we can learn that in the archaeological record. So if you can answer yes to any of these questions, does the site have integrity? Is it definable? Is it associated with events or people? Or can we learn more about the past, more than we could do in other things? Then chances are your site is eligible for the National Register. Usually sites must be at least 50 years old to be on the register. And when I first started in archaeology, I thought that is a long time. Now that I'm 50 years old, it is not a long time. So 50 years in the ghost, anything from 1973, <laughs> and earlier could go on the National Register. And even things that aren't uh, that old yet, if they're associated with really important events. So for example, the 9-11 site in New York City is on the National Register of Historic Places. It is not more than 50 years old, but it is associated with one of the most pivotal events of the last 20 plus years. And so it is on the National Register. So there are always exclusions or, or exemptions to that policy. Okay, so step phase one, is there a site there, yes or no? Phase two, is that site cool, yes or no? If you answer three, yes, it's cool, then you have to go to mitigation. So the mitigation step is basically an understanding that you have a site, it's either on or eligible to the National Register, and that what you're going to do to that site is going to have an adverse effect. It is going to negatively impact that site. If you, add, if you go through those steps and you figure that out, then we go to phase three, which is called mitigation. And there are different ways to go about, this is, this is a whole nother talk in and of itself, but essentially the first step in mitigation, the easiest step is avoidance. If you find a Native American site um, while you're putting in your trail and you can avoid that site by moving your trail, you're done. You don't have to do any more archeology. span You figured out the site was there. You figured out the site was cool and people care about it. Uh, the third thing says, I can avoid it. I can go around it. Uh, oftentimes, though, we can't avoid sites. Um, this is where the road has to go because of safety reasons. This is where this erosional event has to be cut back to because the river is eroding and it's going to all go away. We have to put in this riprap. This is where the trail has to go because there's two wetlands on each side. We're not going to fill in wetlands uh, to do this. This is the location. So if we can't uh, avoid, then we uh, try to minimize our impact. Maybe we, instead of grading for your trail, we elevate your trail, we add soil to your trail and we just cover over where the site's at. Now you're minimizing your impact to the, to the, to the archeological site. That's really good, but maybe you can't do that either. So when you get to that third step, I can't avoid it. I can't minimize it. I have to go right through it. Uh, then archeologists come in and we try to learn as much as we can about it in a phase three. Usually that's a data recovery. In all three of these examples here, we are exposing the entire area of the site and we're trying to learn as much about it as we can. This one in this picture in the middle is the very first chapel at Fort Snelling that was built in the 1880s. Everyone knows about the Fort Snelling Chapel that's there today by the airport. That's the third chapel. This is the first chapel. And that's right where utilities had to go. And so I went and did the work for that. On the left here, that is um, the... 1880s through 19, early 1900s uh, uh, sawmill that's in North Minneapolis. That's part of a project right now we're working on. That's where they have to put their road because there's going to be development on the other side and there's a thing called Mississippi River on the other side so they can't put it in another place. 
So we're learning as much as we can about that um, before the road gets there. Uh, and then the other one here on the right is a whole bunch of utility work happening and where we found a series of uh, privies or bathrooms from the historic period at Fort Snelling. And so we have to excavate and learn as much about those as we can. So phase one, was there something there? Yes. Phase two, was it cool? Yes. Phase three, how are we going to answer and learn as much about archaeology if we cannot avoid it or minimize its impact? Then we dig it up. Um, that's really the three phases. Uh, Cost-wise, your early phase one work is probably going to cost between five to $10,000 for your project, depending upon the size, how big your trail is, how far you live from other archaeologists, and how far they have to drive to get there. Do they have to stay overnight in hotels to do their work? Most work, though, that's near the metro area. Most of my phase one projects are $5,000 or less, up to $8,000. Phase two usually doubles that cost. And then phase three projects, they're big, they're expensive, they can easily be. Uh, six figures in cost, um, but really, you rarely get to phase three projects. There's only currently, last year, there was only one phase three project in the state of Minnesota. So that was licensed by the state archaeologist's office, because usually we find out that this, where the sites are and we avoid them before you start your construction project. All right, so here are some takeaways. Um, I'm just going to wrap this up quickly here. One, archaeology is time and labor intensive. Everything is done by hand. We don't use mechanical things. We really learn about the past by getting our hands dirty. And it takes a while. And people are expensive. Uh, we're not as expensive as construction people, I'll tell you that much. Our rates are much lower than theirs. We don't have to have as much insurance. We don't have to have giant $100,000, $200,000 pieces of equipment. Uh, shovels don't cost that much. But we take time. It takes a couple of weeks sometimes to do our work. Sometimes you can get it done in a day if we're just walking a field. All right, But it does take time. And also re realize that once we do our work, you're going to submit that to an agency to review that work, and they're going to take their time to review it. The State Historic Preservation Office takes 30 days to review projects. It doesn't matter if your project is really, really important to you or the coolest thing that's ever happened for you. They're still going to take 30 days. It's a process, and it's a slow process. All right, so get started early. Um, and also, one of the biggest things is don't panic. Archaeology doesn't stop your project from happening. The only time archaeology stops your project is if we find human remains. Uh, then we have to stop. And maybe if you're in a, in a cemetery setting, maybe it's a good idea you don't build whatever you're building in that place. If you still really have to do it because you're a highway project or something like that, um, then those bodies may be exhumed. Um, they may have to go through a repatriation process, and that will definitely take years of time. But if it's a normal archaeological site uh, for both Native Americans and Euro Americans, we don't stop your project. We want to learn as much about the past, and we still want your thing to happen. Um, and the reason for that is because the public loves archaeology. We care about the past. When you can hold something from the past in your hand, it immediately connects you to people in the past, and you start to realize that I'm the same as they are. I have the same thoughts and feelings, the same emotions. I'm still materially driven, and I can, I can learn a lot about people in the past by seeing the things that they have. So kids love archaeology. Adults love archaeology. I can't tell you how many times when I'm doing a project, people just pull over on the side of the road, and they jump out of their car. What are you doing? That's, that's so cool. I love archaeology. I'm, I'm really popular at dinner parties. Everybody wants to talk to the archaeologist. What's the coolest thing you ever found, right? It happens all the time. So because of that, realize that um, knowing about the archaeology that's on your project is a benefit. When we're doing our archaeological survey, you could have the public work with us. I'm more than happy to have members of the public, volunteers come out. I do dozens of volunteer-driven archaeology projects every year. Um, we have two to 15 members of the public out there walking fields with us. When, when Gina first started doing work with me, she came right out there and, and learned what we were doing by walking fields. Tribal historic preservation officers learn by walking fields with us and seeing things in the past. Kids love it. Adults love it. Um, and when you finish your project and you put in your trail, it's a good idea to have some interpretive signage to let people realize you're not the first person to walk in this place. People have been loving and enjoying and protecting this space for thousands of years, and it's important that we do the same thing. So it creates really good ties in to people in the past. So 
that's that's really the short version of what archaeology is, the three phases of what archaeology is for doing cultural resource management or business archaeology. I want to take the, the opportunity here to thank you for, for being here today. I have two QR, QR codes here. One of them is for my company, where you can find out everything about my company, uh, and you can ask me questions there. The other one is for Patreon. I don't know if you're familiar with Patreon, but it's a subscription service where you can basically subscribe just like you know, YouTube or something like that. Uh, we produce lots of content. I do lots of public archaeology that is not funded through uh, normal funding sources just because I'm a passionate archaeologist. Uh, and we try to find ways to pay for that, those to do presentations and stuff. So Patreon is one of the things that I use. So if you're interested in archaeology and you want to give back to that uh, community to help professionals do public good, consider becoming a member of our Patreon channel. All right, I'll, I'll uh, leave it there at this point so we have time for questions. <laughs>